be reading from uh, Revelations 20, verses 7 through 10. And when the thousand years are ended, Satan will be released from his prison and will come out to deceive the nations that are at the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them for battle. Their number is like the sand of the sea. And they marched up over the broad plain of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints and the beloved city. But fire came down from heaven and consumed them, and the devil who has, had deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and sulfur where the beast and the false prophet were, and they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. Country music. Raise your hand if you like it. If you don't like it, you're wrong. <laughs> I'm going to start reading some lyrics. I want to see if you can recognize the song and maybe who sings it, okay? There's a man going around taking names, and he decides who to free and who to blame. Everybody won't be treated all the same. There will be a golden ladder reaching down when the man comes around. The hairs on your arm will stand up at the terror in each sip and in each sup. Will you partake of that last offered cup or disappear into the potter's ground when the man comes around? Hear the trumpets, hear the pipers, 100 million angels singing. Multitudes are marching to the big kettle drum, voices calling, voices crying. Some are born and some are dying. It's Alpha and Omega, kingdoms come. And the whirlwind is in the thorn tree the virgins are all trimming their wicks. The whirlwind is in the thorn tree. It's hard for thee to kick against the pricks. Till Armageddon, no shalom, no shalom, no shalom, no shalom. When the father, hen, will call his chicks home. The wise men will bow down before the throne. And at his feet, they'll cast their golden crowns when the man comes around. Anybody recognize that song? Johnny Cash. When the Man Comes Around is a whole song dedicated to Revelation, the book of Revelation. Now, why do I use Johnny Cash and, and the song When the Man Comes Around as the introduction for this lesson? Because the whole song is about a, a man who will come around. I'll give you one guess who that man is in the song. That's Jesus, Jesus Christ. Did y'all know he's coming back? He came back from the dead. Did you know he's coming back another time? Do you believe that? And there's a lot of people who did not answer. There's a lot of people who are just looking at me who was static faces. Did you know that Jesus Christ is coming back? Yes. We believe that because it's going to happen. Because we believe the Bible. We believe in God. We believe that Jesus Christ is coming back. Our lesson this morning is coming from Revelation chapter 20. We're going to start in verse 1. But a little, a little disclaimer, okay? There has been, there will be, and there probably will always be controversial debate on the book of Revelation. To extrapolate a literal meaning from the book of Revelation is met with difficulty because the writer, John, uses symbolism, uses imagery to, imagery to convey truths, to convey concepts. Am I here to enter that debate? Not at all. And when it comes to Revelation chapter 20, there's kind of a, a subsection of debate because a thousand years takes on certain meanings in different groups. You've got a millennialist, you've got post millennialists, you've got pre millennialists, all kinds of millennialists. And all of them have opinions as to what the thousand years means. I'm not here to discuss that, but I'm here to convey that there are truths that we can hold near and dear and confidently from Revelation chapter 20, from verses 1 through 10. Another disclaimer I am not going to try to 
convince you or persuade you or inform you of something that you didn't already know about Revelation chapter 20. Who in here didn't know that Revelation chapter 20 verses 1 through 10 was about the victory of Christ? I imagine all of us knew that. There is a Bible class devoted to Revelation. I don't know where they are in, in the book. I've been, I've been in, in another class. But if, if you haven't got to 20, sorry, spoiler alerts, victory is Christ's. Um, but even so, I believe there are some truths that we can glean from the first 10 verses of this chapter. Before I do that, I'm going to read another verse of another song. This one we will probably all recognize. Even if you're not country fans, you will probably recognize this one. It's been in a lot of country songs, but you probably recognize this one. I heard an old, old story. How a Savior came from glory, how he gave his life on Calvary to save a wretch like me. I heard about his groaning, of his precious blood's atoning. Then I repented of my sins and won the victory. O oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He sought me and bought me with his redeeming blood. He loved me ere I knew him, and all my love is due him. He plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing flood. Jesus Christ is and forever will be our victory. I'm going to highlight some portions of the first 10 verses in Revelation 20 where victory does not come from. We know where it does come from. That's Jesus Christ. But let's check out the, verse, uh, the first three verses of Revelations chapter 20, okay? There's awesome stuff all throughout the Bible recorded of angels and their wondrous deeds. So let's check out this wondrous deed in the first three verses of the chapter. Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, holding the key of the abyss and a great chain in his hand. And he took hold of the dragon, the serpent of, of old, who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. And he threw him into the abyss and shut it and sealed it over him so that he would not deceive the nations any longer until the thousand years were completed. After these things, he must be released for a short time. Now, there is no victory found in this angel, even though he did some really cool stuff. I mean, binding the serpent, binding the devil, throwing him into the abyss. That's some pretty cool stuff. But victory is not found in the angel. Angels are created beings by who? By God. You can say that confidently. That's okay. Angels were created beings meant to serve God. There's no victory found in them. Even though they do really cool stuff, and then we, we see him binding Satan, whoever this angel is. But there's no victory found in him. Let's continue on. Yes, sir. Verse 4. <laughs> I didn't expect that to be a conversation. I thought it was like he was just giving me an opinion, and I was, anyways. All right. Verse 4. Then I saw thrones, and they sat on them, and judgment was given to them. And I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded because of their testimony of Jesus and because of the word of God. And those who had not worshipped the beast or his image and had not received the mark on their foreheads and on their hands. And they came to life and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. The rest of the dead did not come to life until the thousand years were completed. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is the one who has a part in the first resurrection. Over these, the second death has no power, but they will be priests of God and of Christ and will reign with him for a thousand years. Now, also, another cool thing. We see the believers, we see the saints coming to some authority. They judge. But by whose command did they judge? Christ, right? I'm going to ask a question. It's rhetorical. You don't have to answer this one. 
Think of, think of the word martyr and what a martyr is and what a martyr means. I think about the significance of a martyr and it falls flat without the cause. A martyr is not a martyr without a cause, right? There is no victory found in the martyrs. There's no victory found in these, in these amazing saints who did not succumb to the evil one but upheld Christ's teaching. There's no victory in them even though they did awesome stuff or they, they did really cool things. A martyr isn't a martyr without a cause. There is no victory. Certainly there is no victory originating from the devil and his demons. In this passage, the adversary is titled with four distinct names that the reader would assume his audience was very familiar with. I mean, he's, he's been the adversary to hu humanity for how long? Since uh, the garden? John knew that his audience was familiar with this adversary. We observe from passages in the Bible that some of Satan's schemes fall flat on their face when he seeks to win, win one over on God. I mean, he wasn't successful in his conversion of Job. He wasn't successful, certainly, in his conversion of Jesus. We see a lot of his schemes fall flat. But that doesn't mean he's not an adversary worthy of consideration. All of us have battled with the adversary, correct? If you haven't, please give me your phone number so I can find out how on earth you've somehow evaded that. All of us have battled with the adversary. What is, uh, Peter says that he's a, a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. He's after each and every one of us. And he's likely had a run in with you. There are some battles you might be remembering in your past that you've lost with the adversary. Because alone, we don't stand very tall, do we? Alone, we don't stand very strong. Because we get our victory from who? When Christ picks up the sword and fights for us, which he did, he conquered death, and he provides this source of salvation for us in life. When, when he is there fighting with us, we know what victory is like. But by ourselves, we can't know what victory is like. Satan certainly doesn't know what victory is like, even though for a time he's granted this world as a playground, and he's doing in it what, what, what he wills. I'm going to shift focus to some certain observations found in verses 7 through 10 of Revelation 20. Thank you, Shrip, for reading it, by the way. When the thousand years are completed, Satan will be released from his prison and will come out to deceive the nations which are at the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together for the war the number of them is like the sand of the seashore. That's not to be uh, trifled with. Their numbers are great. They're going to span the breadth of the earth. And the battles with them are going to seem incredibly large, because it is. What does the text say, though? Let's see it. Verse 9. And they came up on the broad plain of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints and the beloved city. In your life, have you felt surrounded by the wicked stuff? In your life, have you felt an enemy closing in? whether that's Satan and his fiery demons or not. 
What is the response to this surrounding of the enemy? In the middle of verse 9, God doesn't even grace the enemy with his presence. That's how powerful he is. And fire came down from heaven and devoured them. That's it. That's the battle. Can you imagine? The saints being camped together, they see all of their enemies, right? Their numbers like the sand on the seashore. They're, com they're coming from all over the planet. Boom, they're surrounding us. That's the end. Fire comes down. God wins the battle. Isn't it kind of anticlimactic? You would expect this, ah, swords, right? And no, you will not. It doesn't happen. God is so powerful, he ends it with fire. How does God end the battles for us today? He sent Christ. He died for us. But how does, how does God end the battles for us today? Some battles, he doesn't. He doesn't end them. It's the test that all of us have to go through. Are we going to be among those who find our strength, regardless of the situation that we're in, in the camp of the saints? Because in verses 7 through 10, that's who the enemy surrounds. There are, lo there are locations that we should be mindful of in verses 7 through 10. We know, we know from where victory comes from, God. We know where the Christians are when the enemy comes. And we know where the enemy will be sent as a result of God's victory. Here's a question for all of us to consider this morning. Where are we? Where will we be on the day of victory? Those who were in the camp were safe because they were in the camp. Does that make sense? Cameron, camp, what are you talking about? I'm talking about the church. Today, the saved and those who are safe are those who are in the church. Those who are in Christ's body. Does anybody in here not want a taste of victory? As it turns, as it turns out, nobody raised their hand. <laughs> Everybody wants a taste of of victory, and the only way to come to that is to be in the winning camp. And we know who the we know the winning camp. It's the church. I'm going to invite you to consider something. Is there a friend or a loved one in your life that you know is not in the camp? Christians have a hope. We have a backbone. That backbone is Christ. So when we're faced with the difficulties and the enemies and the, the, the surrounding fear, we have a reason to not succumb and collapse and just fall flat because our backbone is Christ. What about those who don't have Christ in their life yet? What is the outcome for those without Christ? It's defeat. Plain and simple. So I'm thinking about the friends, I'm thinking about the family in my life, the people that I text every day, the people that I talk to on a regular basis, who I know don't have Christ in their life. What's my job? With my feet in the camp, what's my job? 
to bring more people into the camp. Right? Even though uh, Revelation chapter 20 is an account of what life is like after Jesus comes back. I have an opportunity now to increase the numbers of that camp. Right? What if I don't? What if I don't take up that uh, responsibility as my own? Defeat for me. I know that might, that might come across pretty strong. But what good is a Christian in name only? We all have jobs to do. We have, a vi- we have a victory to enjoy if we pursue the life that Christ has invited us to pursue. How do I get to be in the camp? If you've heard the word of God and you believe it to be true, that belief would invite you to change something about yourself and repent because by yourself, there's not much victory found. Next up, a belief would likely cause you to confess with your mouth, with your words and your voice that Jesus Christ is Lord and that he is the only one who can bring victory to any of us. You put yourself to death, metaphorically, in the waters of baptism. That's the pattern of the New Testament. Romans chapter 6 tells us, I have to die to let Christ live in me. And after that, we live to the best we can the life that Christ has invited us to live. That's the lesson. Plain and simple. Where is our victory? It's in Christ. If we're Christians in this room, let's be worthy of the name. Let's invite others to that camp so that we can be found in it when Christ comes back. If there is any need from anybody in here to join the camp or you want to learn more, we got a host of people who love and care about you and want to study more with you and want to talk with you so that at the end of this life, you can be confident where you're going. If you have a need, Come forward if you want to at at this song or find somebody after the service. But if there's a need, don't, don't let that go unchecked because all of us want a taste of victory and that's in Christ. With those words, would you come forward as we stand and as we sing?